Good morning. Welcome to Ordinary Life, which is an educational offering by St. Paul's United Methodist Church. I'm Bill Curley, and this is... I'm Holly Headley. Here's some money. Oh, and here's some money. Bill is handing me the money tray to talk about how grateful we are for donations to Ordinary Life. Because at the, around this time of year, we get the deep pleasure of giving that money away to nonprofits who are generally engaged in serving the poor and underserved communities in Houston and working to uplift and empower. Um, so it is that time of year when you go to donate, you can uh, click the donate button on our website. It takes you to a form and on that form in the memo, you just type in ordinary life and we're so appreciative. Thank you so much for everything that you guys have done. And every week I thank the people who are here in this room making this possible, Tim Leatherwood, John Watson, Olivia Watson, William Budge. Um, we and need to say like how cool Olivia and William are. They're cool. They're, they're just, we love y'all and we're really grateful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and besides, they're giving you lessons on your new phone. Yes, I mean, plus they are giving me lessons on my new phone. And Tim this morning told me that <clears throat> he has put the first part of the Jackie Lewis webinar on the Ordinary Life website. It's on the landing page, he said, right under the Michael Moore link to the Michael Moore webinar. So if you missed the Jackie Lewis, um, you can go to our website and, and find that. Mm -hmm. It was an exciting, energizing time. So this afternoon at 4 o'clock, there will be a town hall meeting. There will be another one Tuesday at 7. We're going to attend the one uh, virtually at 4 this afternoon. It's really easy to do. Just go to, the, uh, go to the St. Paul's website and just scroll down just a smidgen. And on the right-hand bottom side, there's a link to the town hall meeting. Why this is important is that we are beginning to plot the future of reopening and other things. Just Jeff is going to give us sort of an update, a state of the church message and answer questions, which you can send in over the webinar. Um, I, I have no idea what the plans are for reopening. I had hoped that we could do it sooner than later, but right now... Not the time to be thinking about that right now with um, COVID surges, is it? It's hard. That was really like a Debbie Downer moment, but it seems like things are on an upswing and not on a downturn. Okay. Okay, Holly, Holly's fine. We, we, want them, we want them to be on an upswing, but uh, yeah. this has gone on a lot longer than anybody anticipated. And um, I'm really grateful to Holly for being here next week we're well, going to do something special <laughs> this week is not special it is special <laughs> but next week is going to be special because we've already pledged ourselves to dress up kind of ridiculously yeah. yes we have we'll just you'll just have to wait and see all right <laughs> and i'll tell you about carl zinner okay do you know carl zinner i don't you'll, you'll learn about carl zinner okay. You know about J.B. Ryan? Yes. They work together. Okay, okay. All right, so I'm thinking this has something to do with Hogwarts magic. Uh, it has to do with wizardry. Yes. But no, magic's too cheap. Magic is cheap. Miracles more Miracle. like. Miracle. Yeah. More like miracles. <laughs> so um, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. As you know... Holly and I have been using, we started out working our way through the Four Noble Truths and then the Eightfold Path. Uh, that took us three months. And then we went through all of the Beatitudes. That was two more months. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this a it's while. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. We have a 25-week podcast that's been going on a while, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Jim Bankston was our guest this past week. Mm -hmm. Do you have any way of knowing how many people listen to that? Can you? Figure? Yes, we can go to analytics and see. I didn't this week, but D does that go out over Squarespace? Mm -hmm. Is that where you check Squarespace the analytics? Squarespace and Apple, um, iTunes. You can um, you can see uh, Apple iTunes and <laughs> sorry, I just got distracted. It's Daryl. <laughs> Hello, hi Daryl. Hi Daryl. <laughs> He's doing some work. Here. We miss you so much. We're at, yeah. 
Yeah. You want to come show your face to the people on to camera? Your mask come on. Back on and do it. <laughs> so Daryl, who is our beloved, you know, employee at St. Paul's, is here doing some work, and we haven't seen him in months. Oh, ever. <laughs> Hello, buddy. Yeah. How are you? Oh. Yeah. Hi, Daryl. <laughs> Everyone, say hi. I'm all back. That's right. We wish. Yeah. Man, I miss seeing you. Yeah. I wish you could get back in front of the camera. Yeah. I'm missing you. Sorry, y'all. We're having a moment that we haven't um, gotten to see Daryl in a long time. You know time. what? I'm so grateful that during this long period of time that St. Paul's has been able to keep people on the staff and paid. Yes, sir. That's a big one. That's a big one. But I'm glad. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's real. Right. Yeah. I like yeah. the beard. Hey, you, you, yeah, it's looking good. You have, you dropped your mic. All right. So well, maybe we need to start all over, <laughs> but we're here <laughs> and we had a moment of celebrating Daryl for a second. Thanks for being with us, Bill. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we derailed. <laughs> well, that was worth it. It was worth it. That was worth it. <laughs> you know, um, Daryl is, um, and Joseph too, yeah. are th probably the first two people that people encounter when they come here. Yes. And yeah. he is so warm and welcoming and happy and yeah. helpful and yeah. everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so well, I was saying, I was saying that after doing the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, my suggestion was that we are going to continue going through the Sermon on the Mount. And if you got the preview that went out about this class, I suggested, why don't you just sit down and read the whole thing? It doesn't take that long. And you will find the, the vast storehouse of wisdom that is contained in this ancient writing. And what makes it new is that we are reading it through the lens of the pandemic, and the frustrations and polarizations and anxieties and fears that people have about that and, and the losses that people have had not only of, of lives but of businesses and plans. You know, we're thinking about will it be safe together for Thanksgiving this year? Yeah. And my, my, We're not going anywhere. Mine is on the cusp of not doing that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so... Um, we're also looking at this through the lens of the need to keep in front of us the systemic racial injustice that's been part of this country's DNA and how we can address that. I don't think because of either of these things we're ever, ever, ever going to go back to things quite as they were. Hopefully, we will certainly not when it comes to that. So we picked another step forward in the Sermon on the Mount today, and I want to begin it by using this quote. Mm. It's one of my favorite lines from Carl Jung. The world will ask you who you are, and if you cannot answer, the world will tell you. Read that again. The world will ask you who you are, and if you cannot answer, the world will tell you. All right, I'm being a nag. <laughs> but this is one of the reasons it's so important to have a daily spiritual practice so that you keep focused on what your identity is. Jesus was very clear about this. And he said, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. I like that that's a direct quote from Jesus. You just have Jesus, dash Jesus on the bottom. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not this straightforward, though. Yes, yeah. Um, this saying is found in Mark and copied by Matthew and Luke. That's what the scholars say. Matthew and Luke got most of their material from Mark, added it, shaped it to fit their own needs. As I've said before, um, 
one of my seminary professors gave me this, gave us, but I was in the class, this kind of analogy about how to think about the teachings of Jesus as they appear in the different gospels. He said, it's like Jesus wrote a piece of music. He composed a piece of music. And then these musicians called Mark, Matthew, and Luke took that music and performed it using their own instrumentation to their own audiences so that it has a different meaning in each of the Gospels. Mark uses it to imply that if we don't, if we don't remain pure, then we ourselves end up in danger. Matthew uses it to say that those who respond to the teachings of Jesus are to be the salt of the earth. And Luke uses it to say that we're to have salt within ourselves <clears throat> and consequently live at peace and as peacemakers. So what did Jesus really mean? I love this cartoon that someone sent me years ago. I had it on my refrigerator for a long time. <laughs> Where Jesus would say, okay, listen carefully. I don't want to end up with four different versions of this. So what did Jesus mean? And the Jesus scholars say, we don't know. So here's, here's what the commentary produced by the Jesus Seminar says. Quote, since the original context of the saying has been lost, it is impossible to determine what it meant on the lips of Jesus. So while reflecting on this passage of the Sermon on the Mount this week, seeking guidance, as I said, during this time of pandemic and distrust, I was found by a poem uh, in a book of poems that I bought called Consider the Lilies, <laughs> Mrs. God Poems by Connie Wenick. Had you ever heard of her? No. And not, and not until I read this one that you before we came in today. There are others that are so great in this book. I mean, just Mrs. God is such a great, such a great subtitle. And well, you you have to have the imagination that yeah. God and Mrs. God are in a conversation, right. right? Right. Okay. So I'll read you one of her one of her poems. Um, and this poem is called "For a Change." Earth had become a job that required constant customer support. Humans didn't seem to understand the basics of their service. Mrs. God suggested a standard message when people first connected. The kingdom of God is within you. Honestly, I think it gives them a sense of agency, she said. But God thought the problem stemmed from a confusing owner's manual. Some of those translation, these translations are inscrutable, he said, paging through the dense instructions. What about a series of drawings where steps would be illustrated with a puzzled little angel, sort of like Ikea? And of course, an extensive FAQ on the website. It's worth a try, said Mrs. God. The most important thing is that people know they're getting accurate information for a change, said God. Um, we could spend a lot of time, and I think that maybe that's what a lot of ordinary life has been about over the years, trying to give accurate information about both religion and spirituality. It is something we are in such need of. So for over the past two years, I have been saying that the accurate information we need when it comes to our religious and spiritual work, will come to us as we step creatively into the vast insights and information that come to us from what we are now calling evolutionary cosmology. And I started referring to it um, about in 2018, beginning of the 2018, as living in the space between the no longer and the not yet. Up until stepping into this space of not knowing, religion has been a source of answers for people. Evolutionary cosmology leads us to ask questions. And I think that this is the greatest challenge facing the Christian church and those who call themselves Christians. It involves bringing into light our present understanding of the cosmos 
into that understanding our most central religious understandings and teachings. Matters like our understanding of God, whatever we mean when we use that word, our relationship to God, and for Christians, how we understand who Jesus was, how he developed, um, where his teachings came from, how he would like to be remembered, as Michael Moore would put it in his talk to us. Buddha taught that suffering comes from ignorance. And for centuries, for centuries, Christian theology has led people to believe that God is not here. I'm thinking, uh, I have to come back this afternoon, even though today is only the 15th of November, and record a pastoral prayer that will be done the first Sunday of Advent. Mm. And Advent, I love the Advent, I love the hymns, I love the rituals, I love all about it, but it all implies that we're waiting for God to show up. Mm. God is right here. God is right here. Mm -hmm. But that's what we've taught for years. That we it, That's one of the reasons that Jung said, tell me how you pray, and I can tell you your whole theology. Because we pray invoking God to come down, waiting for God to come down, that sort of thing. Now, the, the early Christians certainly believed in and practiced the presence of God. That's another thing I think a spiritual practice is good for, to help us practice the presence of God. For example, Teresa of Avila recognized that a powerful indication of the presence of ignorance is praying as if God were not present. Praying as if God were not present grows out of the belief, the ignorant belief, that we are separate selves living in a dualistic field of energy. And evolutionary cosmology teaches us that neither of these things is true. The cosmos is one, and so are we. And our spiritual work, and it is both intensely personal and outrageously political, is to heal this divide, or these divides. There is no divide, of course, but we don't experience that. If we did, we'd be nicer to each other, more respectful because everywhere we went, we would know we are on holy ground and everyone we encounter, would, we would know as one of those Jesus refers to as my brother or my sister. Now, most of us have grown up being taught in one way or another that there were these people who a long time ago did something that really ticked God off and this now, very angry God kicked them out of what was called the Garden of Eden. And this original sin has been passed on to every human since then. And the teaching has been that until Jesus came, this God's heart has been closed to humans. But Jesus was willing to die on the cross to save people from their sins. And this makes everything okay if you happen to believe this. And this belief system is brokered by the church. It's, you have to have some sort of special access to it. Mm. Now, evolutionary uh, cosmology is causing us to rethink every aspect of this story. Actually, the story in its present form didn't really take shape until the 14th century. Uh, but an understanding of an angry God, you can find that in the Hebrews, throughout the Hebrew scriptures. What frees us when it comes to Jesus is not his death, but his life, his teachings. And one of those teachings is you are the salt of the earth. And this talk today is designed to lift the teaching up and to probe our lives with it as well as to seek the relevancy of this teaching you're the salt of the earth for this time of pandemic and distrust. I'm hmm. passing the wand. <laughs> Thanks. I love the way that Eugene Peterson translates this whole section. And I'm dying, of course, to bring in the God colors here, but we'll just, we'll stick with the God flavors today. <laughs> um, salt is one of my favorite things. I think I've heard you say that too, that you salt your food before you taste it. Yeah. <laughs> and... When I want to snack, I more often than not reach for chips, salty almonds, 
those nut thin crackers. I love them with hummus. I love dark chocolate with salted caramel, pretty much salted caramel anything. It's that first sweet blend of salt and sweet that I love. Um, when I was pregnant with my oldest, I think I ate french fries almost every day. Turns out they, weren't, they didn't have great nutritional value, but my oldest loves french fries also, so I don't know if that's sort of an inherited thing. Uh, I later learned that craving salt is actually also an indicator that your adrenals are whacked out, which means you're chronically stressed. So sounds like stress is a, or salt is a stress food. Pre-COVID, I went a couple times to this float spa in the Heights, in which you get in a little pod that you actually put your body you in there. Put your body in it, and you you are it's the size of your body roughly. So you're floating. You curled up. You don't have to do anything except lie there on your back oh. to say stay, stay suspended. Because it's, it's, it's infused with so much Epsom salt that... They put it, water in this thing? Mm-hmm. It's water infused with Epsom salt. And it's so buoyant that you, I mean, you can't sink, even if you tried. I suppose you could turn over and go face down, in which case you might be able to. But um, anyways, it's, it's pretty neat because it increases the water density. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> wait, is there no light in there? there see that blue light? You can put on these, you can choose your light. You can choose no light and just be in complete darkness and it's like total sensory deprivation. How long do you stay in there? 30 to 60 minutes. No. It's actually really relaxing. You can fall asleep. Anyways, Bill's in a little disbelief while we let him sit here with his mouth open. <laughs> I'll keep going. <laughs> So anyways, it's, it is about sensory deprivation and your body just being in a total state of relaxation without any tension or stress. So you're not, you're not hitting any surface. You're floating. It's actually a lot like Descartes' floating man uh, experiment, if you will. I'll get into that later. But anyway, so it turns out salt is both a stress reliever and it's a stress food. In the eighth grade, even, I did my science fair project on salt and water. I mean, this is really a lifelong love affair. <laughs> and I learned that salt, my dad was right there with me, helping me through it. I learned that salt increases the specific heat of water, which really just means it makes water boil faster. Salt has pretty cool intrinsic properties, too, besides alleviating my stress or feeding it. It increases other flavors. In cooking, you add dashes of salt throughout to enhance it. So you usually don't put all of your salt in right away. You just add dashes of it over time. Is this the way you cook? So that it enhances the flavors as you're cooking. And too much salt, of course, makes your lips pucker and you want to just down a whole bunch of water. And not enough, enough salt can make for a pretty bland meal. And there is, of course, like anything, that perfect balance, a just right amount of salt. Salt is also a preserver. In the case of meats, it helps to preserve the, um, the health qualities of meat as well as the flavor. And so if you eat things like beef jerky or dried meats, that's either salt or salami, things like that. And it's also a disinfectant. So it's used to clean and it's used to purify. Salt flavors, salt preserves, and salt cleans. These will tie together, just bear with me. Salt doesn't do anything other than what it's designed to do. So how does that apply to this saying of Jesus? It's not giving you a new role to play in the world. It's not saying, don't be you, be salt. But it's naming that you too already have intrinsic properties that make you, you. You don't have to work to become who you are, only to be who you are. Salt doesn't try to be sugar. It can't. You gradually add more salt and more of its intrinsic qualities and the flavor of that thing intensifies. So as you be more you, your flavor intensifies. It's a continuation in many ways of the Beatitudes, which essentially say, you're blessed, now go be a blessing. You are salt, now go be salty. To fulfill these laws that Jesus puts forth is different than following the laws. So fulfillment of the laws and following the wall, laws are different. Simply abiding by them isn't enough. In the same way that salt brings out the flavors of a meal, fulfilling the laws 
of the empowered community always bends towards justice, mercy, and kindness. Fulfilling the laws means to embody them in spirit and substance and to increase your flavor or livelihood of everyone around you. A little invocation I found and adapted in my reading this week. So if y'all were here, I would point to you to say the part of the people when we get to this slide. And if you are so inclined, please do so from home. So it starts like this. It was a dull, tasteless thing. And you would say, this, this life, life before, before salt. salt. Yeah. It was a dark, meaningless thing. This, this life, life before light. And then Jesus came. We thought to do just what he was meant to do. But to our, oh, I missed that part. To our surprise, he expected something of us, saying, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So let's go first with salt as a preserver. We don't salt meat so much anymore in our homes because of refrigeration. It's not required in order to keep meat okay. And before modern conveniences, people's ability to survive a meal were intimately tied to whether or not the meat had been preserved or salted. As soon as flesh is torn away from an animal and prepared for eating, it begins to die, rot, or crumble. If it's not cured, pretty immediately, an animal that could potentially feed the entire village could go bad or could even kill an entire village if it's not cured correctly. Uncured meat spreads disease. So in Jesus' time, salt was an imperative to keeping the meat and the people healthy. To be clear, salt does not bring anything back to life, but it sustains life when it's used. Be like salt. Get right with your own flesh, your own self, preserve yourself in just the right way, and then give life to others with your gifts. Your special flavor of salt is your gift. What's your favorite kind of salt, Bill? Uh, kosher salt. Mine is truffle salt. I love I know, What is truffle salt? It has mushroom flavor in it. Oh. Yeah, so like I love truffle fries with salt and truffle oil on them. I have been given a lot of different kinds of salt as gifts over the years. Uh-huh. Um, my daughter gave me some salt a couple of Christmases ago from Egypt mm -hmm. that had dirt in it, mm. red dirt. Wow, clay salt. Clay salt, yeah. and it was supposed to be really good. I, I, I used it some. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well. <laughs> my tendency, I've got to be really careful or I will oversalt sure. food. Yeah, yeah, you got to just little, little pinches. My favorite, so my favorite is truffle salt. I love it on French fries. I've already talked about my love affair with French fries. But my favorite way to be salt, probably you know this, is by learning and teaching and acting on justice issues. It's clear that a big one for me is racial justice and I'm definitely on a lifelong learning journey here. So I may show up in a particular way at a particular point along this long, slow arc of time that bends towards justice. But we all have a place along that arc. Some of us can support with money, some of us with our hands and feet, some with our position and some with our creativity. Incredible art has been made during this time of both pandemic and racial injustice. I love how the public um, in Richmond, Virginia co-opted this contested Confederate statue of Robert E. Lee and made it a public art piece. It's gotten more and more and more layered as the months have gone on and it's just becoming beautiful. A photographer took photos of um, black ballerinas doing dances in front of the, uh, of, of the statue. So it's a reclamation of sorts. Sometimes justice work is super close to home for me, making sure my kids know they are loved and seen and valued, even if the world doesn't always see them that way. Joy and hope are a kind of resistance. We could call this salt morality. Salt morality is not necessarily political, but it can be. Politics are so often about compromise, about the least worst option, or even the worst worst option. Political morality produced slavery, the three-fifths compromise, separate but equal, apartheid. And salt morality is not necessarily commercial, which is based on the bottom line, personal wealth, and keeping money out of the hands of the poor, who the wealthy have often deemed incapable of handling money. 
So the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor because the wealthy so often control the direction of money. Commercial and political morality work to uphold systems like mass incarceration, poor public education, and redlining. Salt morality, however, works outside of those systems. It brings life and nourishment. It calls us to be peacemakers, meek, humble, in a vicious and violent world. It is the way of people like Jesus, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Martin Luther King, Jane Addams, Desmond Tutu, Gandhi, so many community organizers right here in Houston who are making a blanket of care for people in community. It's found in food pantries, free or affordable health care, and decent housing. It's found in democratizing resources. Salt morality is driven by love and a fundamental belief in equity. It always asks, where does it hurt? And it seeks to repair and empower. Salt morality believes that God is everything, everything that is or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that you found it, you found salt. That's a quote in Alice Walker's The Color Purple. So salt preserves the innate liberation, the innate dignity, and the right to be as you are of all people. I realize that each of us can think of a person that we don't exactly like, maybe even of someone who is pretty awful and hurtful. This is maybe radical to say, but I do believe that there are very few truly terrible people in the world. I think people go make choices and each choice bends them more toward, as Martin Luther King says, extremism for love or for hate. If we had a world, however, in which people did not fall away from their true center, from their salt selves, so easily for political or commercial gain, not so many of us would be awful. At least I think we would have a community to return to if they were loving and blanketed. Even though most of us participate in a religion that preaches radical forgiveness and love, we are a society who has become expert at believing people irredeemable so that we lock them away forever. Remember William Blake's poem, The Two Songs? I read it a couple of weeks ago, and it ends like this. Mercy would be no more if there were no body poor. Mercy is the way and mercilessness is born when we deviate from that way. So as I say that, I'm also very sure that if a rabid racist or a killer or a rapist were in front of me, I would have a hard time with radical forgiveness. I only believe that if we had a more just and loving society, we wouldn't have that kind of violence in the first place. It's absolutely important to keep boundaries with harmful people. And I want to imagine where there are a world where there are fewer hurting people who are also hurting people. What's that quote? Hurt people, hurt people. Uh, and the truism that I use a lot about what we don't transform, we yes. transmit yeah. over and over. Yeah. So <clears throat> for the duration of my marriage, our marriage, I have done all of the cooking mm -hmm. with a few exceptions. Um, Sherry makes great bacon and eggs. Bacon's really salty. Yeah, I love bacon. <laughs> he can't go wrong having bacon. No, never. <laughs> and she can make potato pancakes and good gravy. Well, I love to cook. Yeah. I don't mean, I mean, I love to cook. And um, during the pandemic and staying in, I have tried to cook a new recipe every day. You tell me about them when we're here. It's so impressive. And it's been made um, richer and more complicated because my two children have given me kitchen devices. Mm -hmm. One is an instant pot, and then most recent acquisition is an air fryer. Mm -hmm. And of course, the first thing I did, being a seven, I went and bought cookbooks <laughs> for the air fryer. <laughs> And the Instant Pot, and I've been going through them, uh, finding recipes. And my waist shows it during this pandemic oh, you're time. Good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love to cook. Yeah. My mother was a great cook. Mm -hmm. My mom is too. 
Ruth, an uh, African-American woman that raised me, was a great cook. Both my kids are great cooks. Um, when I was in the fourth grade, I could make a devil's food cake from scratch. It's impressive. It also made a big I mess. I can make water boil faster with salt. Okay. <laughs> you don't like to cook. I do, actually. Okay. I just have gotten less creative about it since having kids. I love it. You know, I, I am also, I believe, here's some things I believe about cooking. You cannot have too much olive oil, garlic, um, what are the other things I say? What? Butter. 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 <laughs> and now I've discovered Irish butter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks to me and John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! That that Sunday, last Sunday, you went was and bought Kerrygold. I went and bought the butter, and I made I made mashed potatoes using it. Well, last John Sunday. Watson and I have an, improved your life tremendously. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so so glad why is that, that butter so good? Because the fat content <laughs> is out of the out of sight. It's grass-fed cows. It's just more pure. Try it. Everyone should. Your spiritual practice this week should be going and buying a block of Kerrygold Irish butter, grass-fed cows, unsalted or salted, it doesn't matter, and a really good loaf of bread. Salted, and get just salted. savor it. It does matter. And you can put it in your coffee. Well, okay, we're going way off track. Okay. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> uh, the recipes that I get, um, I take as suggestions. I think you look at a recipe and figure out how you can play with it, what other ingredients you could use. If you could use chicken instead of fish, or how would this be if I used pork instead of beef, and that sort of thing. All the recipes, all the recipes, without exception, say season to taste. Now, somebody's going to send me a bunch of recipes that say don't season to taste, but all right. So what relevance does this have to what we're talking about? Well, I want to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus. And at the same time, I want to serve up a delicious meal out of those teachings that will allow us to set aside outmoded religious doctrines so that we end up with a more spiritually nourishing dish. Let me tell you two things that I believe about religion. About religions, all religions. I'll do it. Okay. First is that human beings are hardwired for religion, just like we are hardwired to speak a language. Now, when I say religion, I don't mean necessarily religion that fits the Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Islamic, Buddhist format, although those are also things that people are hardwired for. People can de develop a religious fervor for a political position, for a sports team um, that, can that can become people's religions. And you see how some fans dress up at football games. They're like acolytes when they paint their bodies and do all the things for the religion that they, that gives them meaning. We're hardwired for a relig religion of some kind. Um, and the second thing that I believe about religions is that they're all humanly constructed. We invent them using the symbols of the culture that we are in, the things that mean a lot to us. Um, we do that. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on the first part of this because I've done that a lot in teachings in ordinary life. But one of the reasons that I want to encourage you to read um, when the Disciple Comes of Age by Daramut Amuraku, and we are going to have him for a webinar probably sometime right after the first of the year, is it will help you understand the first part about how religions over a long period of time um, just seem to be innate in, in, in human consciousness and human structure, the need for a religion of some kind. The first rituals that we have in the human community, as far as uh, anthropologists and archaeologists have been able to discover, are rituals around death and, and burial and some belief in an afterlife or, or a life after this one. They go back centuries and centuries and centuries. Some animals have rituals around death, too. Elephants. Elephants do. I knew that. 
Mm -hmm. Primates. Uh, primates do. Some indications that whales do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And others. Now, most of us don't experience that the religion we have is a human construct because the religion that most people practice is a religion that was simply handed to them. I know that was true in, in my case. I grew up in a family that was uh, very religious in terms of frequenting religious services, going to church, and I was simply told this is um, the, the religion that we practice, believe it, and that's it. Most religions come from a worldview that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, this is true here at St. Paul's. Um, for some people, it is beyond jarring that we continue singing hymns and reciting a creed that comes from a pre-Copernican worldview. And some people have to do a lot of translation and, and uh, poetic translation to make it possible for, to continue to do that and for others and I would be in this camp it's just mind-boggling that apparently according to the pollsters um, who claim to know more about this stuff about 80 percent of evangelical Christians today have wedded their religious beliefs to a political position um, and, and even so much as to see that their religious ideology is something that is given to them as God's will uh, to carry out. Now, you know, at least academically, that the creeds and the scriptures in the Christian church were conceived and written with this pre-Copernican worldview. We know that virgins don't get pregnant that people, no matter how holy they claim to be, can't walk on water. We know this stuff. We know that uh, claiming that somebody ascends into heaven in a world where we now have such a different view of cosmology just doesn't make any sense. Now, I know this kind of talk is upsetting to some people. And if you're in that camp, let's talk about it. I don't mean to upset anybody. I'm trying to open the door for something that will give us more liberation, more space to move around in, a broader understanding and appreciation of the world. I believe that we will be strengthened in our faith and not weakened if we not only articulate what we believe, but also talk about the grounds on which we believe it. I think everybody ought to be able to articulate what you believe and why. Now, although I want to be clear that Holly and I are both recommending that you read this book, we're not actually teaching from it at the moment. That We're not drawing our content from this book. But we reference it because our Muraku articulates this profound belief that one of the primary responsibilities of a person on a religious and or spiritual path is that that person grow up, that that person be mature, that that person live in the real world, that we take responsibility for what we believe. Now, let me, uh, if you're uncomfortable, uh, let me just give you some comfort about discomfort. Uh, every theory of psychological development that I know about, every theory of faith development that I know about, indicates that moving from one level of belief to another, we're going to have questions and doubts and discomforts. The point is, doubts and or discomforts should not hold us back. So a question I would ask you is, how does the faith that you hold, how did it get shaped in you? Uh, and, and what's shaping it now? As I said, I was told, here's what we believe in this family. Accept it, believe it, trust us, it's the truth, and we'll go forward. Mm -hmm. And I soon found out that not all of that was true. So one of the things ordinary life is about is taking our beliefs out of our pockets and seeing where they came from and how, not if, 
but how they need to be updated in light of our new understandings of the cosmos. How do we think about prayer? How do we think about the Bible? How do we think about Jesus? Um, I think Michael Morwood's question about how would Jesus himself want to be remembered? Um, a lot that's attributed to Jesus was put in the mouth of Jesus long after he was dead. This is one of the ways that we can participate creatively in the process of evolution. Ilya Delio says that most people are not aware that we are, we, evolution is not something to believe in. Evolution is something that we're involved in. We are involved, we are evolving, we are involved in an evolving cosmos all the times. And I think embracing this is one of the ways that we can be the salt of the earth. I love that you talked about, you know, being hardwired for religion and um, how religions then are, are human cons constructs. Even though religion doesn't always produce wonder, it so often produces answers for the ways that we can behave. When we get into faith, humans are also, I think, hardwired for wonder, for to wonder about something outside of our existence. Mm -hmm. And it's the wonder piece that I would love to encourage relig how, how religion and cosmology or religion and science can sort of come together, mm -hmm. right? But this is, you know, so when we think about Jesus' words and being like salt, and one of the interpretations of salt is that it, it, it's purifying. And I think that that can be misused at times. And I got to be really careful here because... There are many who might fall along the far right that use the idea of cleanliness to uphold ideas of racial superiority. That was certainly the case in uh, Nazi Germany when German propaganda supported programs that ghettoized European Jews as Hitler came to power. So this is propaganda. On the one side, you see the sort of strong, idealized Aryan race. On the other side, it says um, the evil Jew. Um, you know, kind of what what they believed they were fighting against. So on Friday night, mm -hmm. we just happened to come across a PBS special on Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, yeah. It's been a while since I've seen that. And then last night we watched the first half of it up until the intermission. Mm -hmm. It's a long movie. It's over three hours. Yeah. But it's about this very thing. Yeah. It's how this... Jewish community is victimized mm -hmm. by the need for purification. Yeah. So this is where um, human constructed beliefs get in our way. When we think that there is sort of a purification or a way to be clean or a way to be pure, and we limit that to our way. Right. Right. So white supremacist groups in the American history are the same. They're committed to racial hierarchies and they want to preserve an America that represents and works primarily for white people. There have been words that I refuse to say used to describe black Americans and other people of color. So I am not talking about cleansing in these ways. I would say that that's more like a bleach way of disinfecting. So I, I have a question to ask you since you said that this issue of, and, and it's clear to listen to you teach, that you have a passion for this racial justice thing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So my question to you is, when it comes to the issue of white supremacy, mm -hmm. is it growing in this country or are we just becoming more aware of it? Um, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But I do think that what's been made is space for it to speak louder. And like last week, I said that over the last 12 elections, the percentages of how people have voted. So um, it has been really similar. Mostly white folks have voted for um, the more conservative candidate and mostly people of color and some white folks have voted for the more progressive if we want to divide it along those lines. But the reason I think that is, is because social justice issues keep showing up in our politics. And um, most people of color or disenfranchised communities don't want to vote against their best interests. And so they're voting for the party. Again, this is po po politic morality. It's not perfect. 
but voting for the party in which they're they're bright to be is the most upheld. Okay. And I so but these posters when I looked this up are recent and what I was reading is that white supremacist and white nationalist pop propaganda is showing up more and more and more in on college campuses. Um, you know, like stickers that you might see on a, a phone pole or on a, one of those electrical boxes that are on the corners of streets. They're just showing up. They're, they're showing up. And you know, so these are recent. These are not from 100 years ago. <laughs> when the last one says diversity destroys nations. In fact, every spiritual belief that is, I think, um, wise and even evolution, evolutionary based is that diversity creates more unity. It doesn't, it is not a destroyer. And what I want to talk about with this is just how salt can actually clean and heal wounds. This is not the kind of cleaning, again, that I'm talking about. So even though there are active, committed white supremacists who may be in the minority, the ethos of white supremacy has pervaded our systems. This is the wound, I believe, in America that we need to heal, the one we need to tend. Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow, writes, no issues have proved more vexing to this nation than the issue of race, and yet no question is more pressing than how to overcome the politics of white supremacy, a form of politics that not only led to an actual civil war, but that threatens our ability ever to create a truly fair, just, and inclusive democracy. So even if we don't identify with those politics, the ethos is still strong enough in our country to prohibit us from creating what would be called an inclusive society. When I was a little girl, I was pretty scrappy. I'm actually still pretty scrappy. <laughs> I just spend maybe less time in the dirt and less time with skinned knees. But I always had skinned knees and elbows. I played softball for almost 20 years and sliding at a second base. I just, I still have permanent scars on my knees from all the times that I had scrapes. I also spent a time, a lot of time in Galveston. That was our beach, right? It's not the most lovely, but it was, it was my beach. And you know when you have a wound, like a scrape on your knee, and you get in salt water, what happens? It really stings. And pretty soon, though, it starts to kind of fizzle and bubble and get that first layer of tender skin back onto it. It doesn't take very much time. And when I looked it up, salt as a healing property, this is what it says. Salt water helps to clean and promote healing by osmosis. The chemical comprising sodium chloride forces the liquid in cells to move out of the body when it comes in contact with them. If those liquids are bacterial, they'll be forced out, effecti effectively helping to cleanse the skin. In fact, a homeopathic solution to um, healing wounds is two tablespoons of salt to one quart of water and to apply it with a rag onto the wound. Mm. Yeah. In the Bible, salt is referenced often. If the biblical context had been in the Arctic, however, we might be talking about whale blubber. Salt was just what was native or indigenous to the land. The Dead Sea is a major source of salt, especially along the massive cliffs of Jebel Ustam, which are constantly changing as they interact with the water and the weather. So these don't stay the same, they change yearly. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> It is. Yeah. So as a metaphor, when Jesus says, be the salt, he's saying, be healers. In some ways, I think we've done wrong by Jesus in that we've put all the responsibilities of healing on him <clears throat> by making him the savior of the world. When in fact, I think he's like a great community organizer. He's saying, nope, y'all, I cannot do this alone. I'm saying to y'all, be the salt. I'm sure he said y'all too. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. It's going to take more than one of us to heal this world. So Adrienne Marie Brown, she's the author of Emergent Strategy, a book I highly recommend, compares this work to being fractals. She writes, Emergence is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. It emphasizes critical connections, authentic relationships, listening with the body and the mind. In emergence, the whole is a mirror of the parts, a fractal. The health of the cell is the health of the species and the planet. There are examples of emergence everywhere, 
Oak trees, for example, don't set an intention to listen to each other better or agree to hold tight to each other when the next storm comes. Under the earth, they're always reaching for each other through their root systems. They grow such that their roots are intertwined and create a system of strength, which is as resilient on a sunny day as it is in a hurricane. Dandelions also don't know whether they are a weed or a brilliance, but each seed creates a whole field of dandelions. We are invited to be that prolific and to return fertility to the soil around us. Octavia Butler wrote, everything you touch, you change. Everything you change, changes you. We are constantly impacting and changing our civilization, each other, ourselves, intimates, strangers. And in that reality, we are working to recreate a world that is by its very nature in a constant state of change, like those salt cliffs in Israel. Emergence shows us that adaptation and evolution depend more upon critical connections. If we were here together, if we could be in a room together and maybe you can close your eyes and kind of imagine this, I might suggest that we all stand up in a giant circle and put our hands on each other's shoulders. And then connected like that, I might signal someone to begin the motion of a wave. Each person's body responds to that motion differently and yet each body is connected to it. You must respond in the way that feels right to you while staying critically and mindfully connected. The ocean works like this, wave after individual wave, all part of the same ocean. A murmuration of starlings works like this too. I've shown this video in here before and I'll let it play behind me silently. It is its own kind of visual meditation. In a murmuration, each bird responds and kind of talks to the seven birds to its left, the seven birds to its right, and they follow each other's mo mo motions and movements. So even though they move individually, they also move as one. And the repetition of this pattern throughout the entire flock, each bird is cared for and kept out of the falcon's talons. We are not called to respond to healing in the same ways, but to create murmurations of healing. So how can we know if our actions are more healing than harmful? I know, for example, when it comes to the racial injustice issues that we're facing really acutely right now, and we pause to consider how deep that runs in our country, it feels totally overwhelming. And it's difficult to sit with that feeling, and many of us are moved into doing something or action rather than sitting with the discomfort. I believe you can do both at once. You can sit, in fact, you must sit. And you can decide how to do or how to be. And remember, salt is being who you are, not becoming. Here are some questions I think we can consider as we find our place among the healers of racial injustice. Am I acting to make myself feel better or because I genuinely care about the cause of equity and inclusion. So is this for me or is this for a broader cause? Number two, am I looking for friendship or am I looking for solidarity? I want to elaborate on this one a little bit. It is so easy to think, well, if I just had more diverse friends, I wouldn't seem racist. I would understand more. I want to just make more friends with people who don't look like me. It is true that genuine relationships help to foster understanding. But I think there's kind of an order of operations here. We can't go into the work of healing and justice hoping to make friends with people. We make friends as a result of our commitment to the work. We need to commit to solidarity, standing by, making sure that we are holding the whole flock, not necessarily to friendship. In fact, there's gonna be people who don't like us. It is likely, however, that friendships grow out of solidarity. I hope that makes sense. The third question, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> the third question is, will I keep showing up even when it's hard? To elaborate on this and relate it to number two, these are going to, there are going to be people who you encounter who aren't keen on you showing up, especially in interracial crowds. People have been harmed. Many people of color have suffered real intense trauma at the hands of the white establishment 
and the resistance in their bodies is real. If you show up in an interracial dialogue group, for example, and you aren't immediately warmly received, the impulse may be to not come back, to give up. This is when we sit with the discomfort. This is when we go back to question number one and press through anyway. It is always, always appropriate to let those who have been historically marginalized or wounded to take the lead. And then number four, what is your long-term plan? In this moment, since the murder of George Floyd, racial justice is a topic almost everywhere. How we shop, where we give our money, what we buy. Um, it's activated thousands of people, but healing takes time. It's not a one-stop shop. If you're awakened and you don't want to go back to business as usual, I encourage you to think about how you sustain your action, whatever it is. How do you move forward with it? It could be as simple as putting $10 towards the social justice movement each month. <clears throat> and wherever you show up, make it sustainable and stay open to learning and listening and loving. So I hope this time today, like salt, permeates your life and leads to healing. The beliefs we hold and the behaviors that we practice are supposed to give our lives a zing. If they don't, they're useless and they need to be thrown out. So what do we add to the world? How do we season what we're given to feed on? I think it's an interesting thing that what held the early Jesus community together was eating, um, eating, eating together. What were they feeding on? Not just literally, but metaphorically. How does it taste? Got a good salty tang to it? One of my hopes of these times in ordinary life is that we come to see life, all of life, as the spiritual adventure it is meant to be, and for the teachings of Jesus to add the essential seasoning that we need to make the journey not only interesting but possible. I don't mean to imply, and you've, if you've been paying attention to Holly the last few minutes, that this is easy. It isn't easy. Life is difficult. I think of the reporter who went to learn about and write a story about Mother Teresa, and after a few days of observing her dealing with the dying in Calcutta, he said to her, I wouldn't do what you're doing for a million dollars. And she said, I wouldn't either. What calls us to wake up, to live with love and compassion, with wisdom and skill, and see all of life as the arena and agenda to experience union with the sacred, my belief is that as long as some people hold on to the upside down wisdom of the teachings of Jesus, it's going to be enough to give flavor to the whole meal of life. That's one of the things it means to be the salt of the earth. Meister Eckhart, that mystic who said, the eye with which I see God is also the eye with which God sees me. He also wrote, the seed of God is in us. Now the seed of God, the seed of a pear grows into a pear tree, and a hazel seed grows into a hazel tree. A seed of God grows into God. Mm. The question for us is, are we so growing? We live in this evolving energy field. Our world is evolving. Is our faith, and does it have a good salty tang? Mm. Let's end with a little benediction. So if salt preserves and it preserves the flesh, and it gives life to others as food. Salt heals. It activates the natural healing processes in the body. If we salt, follow salt morality and salt healing, we inevitably find ourselves living with more flavor. So find that place along that long, slow arc that bends toward justice. We're the ones who bend it. We are time benders, and each of us in our own small but significant ways. The benediction is, Alleluia, Jesus declared us salt and light. May we season the world with love and dispel the darkness of injustice. See you next week. <laughs>